welcome to the news at when. When, ancient Egyptian times, over 3,000 years ago, when the ruler of Egypt was a nine-year-old boy called Tutankhamun. He had a very strange family. For more details, here's Bob Hale with the Pharaoh Report. Thank you, Sam. Well, it's 1341 BC, and we're over here in ancient Egypt, where a wickle baby has just been born. And his name is Tutankhamun, though he's also known as Tutankhamen, Tutankhamun, Tutankhaten, Amun Tut, Ankh, Steve, and King Tut, though probably not Steve. And her King Tut's dad was also a king, a pharaoh called Akhenaten. At least we think that's his dad. It's very hard to be sure because it was so long ago that no one can really remember. Not even my nan, and she's really old, though she certainly doesn't look it. Love you, nan. What we do know is that when King Tut was just six years old, Akhenaten died. Yes, his daddy became a mummy, which is a very complex operation. And King Tut's big brother, Smenki, becomes Pharaoh, and then promptly dies, only to be replaced by his sister, Nephi, who then promptly dies, meaning that at just nine years old, Tutankhamun becomes Pharaoh, which I think is fair enough. All right, all right, no more jokes. Of course, running a country is no job for a nine-year-old because it's far too boring. So King Tut's uncle turns up, a chap called I, and he says he will keep an eye on things. <laughs> sorry, sorry, forgot. So Uncle I runs the country so that King Tut can get on with doing all the fun stuff that kids do, like playing games, going to school, and getting married. Yep, getting married. And if you thought that was weird, to keep his royal bloodline pure, his new wife is also his sister. And she used to be his stepmom, so it's double. Anyway, King Tut grows up, Uncle I hands over power to Mr. and Mrs. Tut, and they rule Egypt together as husband and wife, mum, sister, and that's the end of that. Also, we thought, but the history books tell us that Uncle I didn't want to give up power, so he killed King Tut by bashing him on the head, a little something like that. Yep, that'll do it. Except that didn't do it. No, it turns out the history books got it wrong and King Tut actually died from an infected broken leg, leaving poor old Mrs Tut with a broken heart and the crown of Egypt, which of course Uncle I wants for himself. And how does he plan to get it? Well, by marrying Mrs Tut, even though she's his granddaughter, which is uh, times this much. Woo! But Mrs Tut has other ideas. She decides to marry a foreign prince called Zananza instead because he's got such a cool name. But sadly, Zananza gets cold feet. Cold everything, in fact, because he dies. Yes, killed on his way to Egypt by a very jealous Uncle I, who then finally marries his granddaughter, and they live happily ever after, ruling Egypt together for ages and ages, and that is definitely the end of that. No question, cross my heart, scouts on her, swear on my nan's life. And what a life she's led. Born in Dublin to a blind darts player, she became the first woman ever to swim across Ireland. And would you believe it, she's 99 today. So come on, everyone. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Nanny Bob. Happy birthday to you. And back over to Sam to blow out the candle. Sam! You join us here today on this sad occasion. Queen Anne Boleyn is about to be beheaded. I am joined here by her husband, King Henry VIII. Your Majesty, how do you feel on this tragic day? <laughs> Ace! <laughs> Fifteen, love. So you're not attending the execution, then? Oh, no. I would have loved to have been there, but I had this game of Tudor tennis booked in the diary. You know how it is. Busy king, countries to rule, volleys to hit. Oh, oh. <laughs> Thirty, love. <laughs> look at his face. Um, that was out, Your Majesty. Are you absolutely sure? My mistake. Good shot. Ah. Thirty, love. <laughs> Isn't playing tennis while your wife's being beheaded a little bit... Well, heartless. Heartless? I have gone out of my way to make things nice for her. Nice? Yes. I ordered the best swordsman in France to lop her head off. Got him in from Calais. Sharp sword. Spared no expense. Good clean blow. Kaboom! Fwa! Head off. <laughs> and she had a fair trial, despite what people said. Is it my fault that that woman was a witch? Ooh! Forty love! <laughs> Forgive me, Your Majesty, but to get the executioner from Calais to London in time, didn't you have to order him before Anne's trial? No, oh, details, details. <laughs> oh, game set and match. <laughs> Look at that, King wins. King wins. Hello. Sire, Anne has now been beheaded. Oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear. I suppose I should go and see the missus. You're going to pay your respects to your late wife. Oh no. No, 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 not her. The new missus, Jane Seymour. She's a real fox. <laughs> oh, by the way, if the whole Jane thing doesn't work out, do you fancy being queen for a little bit? Tempting. Yeah. Back to you in the studio. <laughs> Hello. 
<laughs> I'm here in Tudor Times to learn more about Tudor horse racing. And who better to tell me about it than the patron of horse racing in England, King Henry VIII? Hello. <laughs> so tell us about today's racing, Henry. Well, actually, I have to inform you that the Pope has demanded an end to all horse racing in England. Oh dear, so, um, so the racing's off then? Are you kidding? <laughs> There's nothing I like more than winding up the Pope. No, we're going to have more horse racing than ever. So you're quite a big fan of the sport then? Oh, I can't get enough of it. At the Royal Paddocks of Hampton Court, I have a stable of 200 horses now from as far afield as Italy and Spain. And does your son here share your interest in horse racing? Oh, good gracious, no, this isn't my son. No, chance would be a fine thing. Wives keep bearing me girls. No, this is one of my jockeys. One of your jockeys? That's a, it's a small child. I know. You see, horses go faster the less weight they're carrying, and there's no smaller jockey than a small child. Isn't that right, small child? Mm. But uh, isn't horse racing a bit dangerous for children? Yes, it is. I get through more jockeys than I do wives. Uh, looks like you're on, small child. Uh, off you go. And you better win! I don't look so shocked. Who do you expect to get on the horse? Me? Well, of course, in my day, I was a fine horseman, yes. Riding, jumping, jousting, hunting. But now, of course, it... Uh, Three elevens is snack, sir. Thank you. Eeny, meeny, miny, big one. <clears throat> yeah. Nowadays, I have to use a hoist to get on a horse. Mm. They're under starter's orders. And they're off! Go on, small child, go on! <laughs> He's off. Really, Henry, there should be a law against using small children as jockeys. Yes, you're right, I suppose. No, I'd better ask the king about that. Hang on a minute. I am the king. No! Now, you fancy watching some cockfighting? It's a wonderful Tudor sport. Two cockerels fighting to the death. Bugsy, I get to eat the loser and the winner. <laughs> Welcome to the news at when. When, Tudor times, when England broke with Rome and got its own church, which really pleased Henry VIII and really upset the Pope. Here with more details is Bob Hale with the Catholic Report. Bob. Thank you, Sam. Well, there it is, Tudor England. That's Henry VIII right there. And as you can tell, it's wall-to-wall -wall Catholics as far as the eye can see, much as it has been for, oh, let's say, 900 years. But Henry's got a bit of a problem because he wants a divorce, which is exactly the sort of thing that the Catholic Church doesn't like. So he asks the Pope if he can have a divorce, and he says, no way, Jose, which is weird because his name's Henry. So what does Henry do? He breaks away from the Pope. There he goes, and he starts up his own church here in England called, unsurprisingly, the Church of England. And since he's in charge of it, he basically grants himself a divorce and marries Anne Boleyn, who's a Protestant, meaning she believes in the Bible, but not in the Pope. Now, since the country's turning Protestant, Henry starts being a bit mean to the Catholics. And by a bit mean, I mean he executes them, closes their monasteries, and takes all their money. Then he gets married another four times, and he dies. Well, that's what six wives will do for you. And that, believe it or not, was the easy bit, as we can see if we look at the religionometer. So, the next king after Henry is someone from your school. No, not really. It's Edward VI, who's only nine years old. And he is a Protestant, that's right. And he's a king for ages and ages and ages until he finally dies at the ripe old age of 15. Yep, 15, when he hands over to Lady Jane Grey, another Protestant who gets to enjoy ruling the country for a whopping nine days before she's overthrown by Queen Mary, a Catholic this time. So Catholic, in fact, that she burns 300 Protestants at the stake. Although, strictly speaking, that's not being Catholic. That's just being horrid. So England is Catholic again, and everyone can just sit down and get used to it. But not for long, because here comes Queen Elizabeth. And you've guessed it, she's a Protestant. She even fights off a Catholic invasion, the Spanish Armada. Then Elizabeth is followed by James I, who's a Scottish Protestant. Or is it a Protestant Scottistan? Either way, he's a Protestant, but he likes Catholics. At least he does until one tries to blow him up. Naughty, naughty Guy Fawkes! And after James comes Charles I, who acts like a Catholic, but basically doesn't care. He just wants to be in charge, which he is, until he's overthrown by that chap. Huh? who's not a Catholic or a Protestant, he's not even a king. Seriously, he's Oliver Cromwell, a Puritan, which is like a really strict Protestant. So strict, in fact, that he chops Charlie's head off and then he bans music, theatre, dancing, Christmas, hedgehogs and fun, except not hedgehogs. Then he dies, hooray, and we get the monarchs back. Woohoo! it's Charles II, who is loads of fun. He's also a Protestant, but he converts to Catholicism on his deathbed. So he's a Catholic, but only for a couple of minutes. Then comes his brother, James II, who is a Catholic, always has been, and not just for a couple of minutes, but he doesn't 
like Parliament. So they chuck him out and bring in his daughter and her husband from Holland, that's William and Mary, and they decide that England is definitely Protestant, as it is today, but only after 185 years of going Catholic, Protestant, Catholic, Protestant, Catholic, Protestant, Catholic, Protestant, Catholic, Protestant. Protestant. You're getting sleepy. You're getting very sleepy. Hand back to Sam. 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 Hi, I'm Penny Bell, and you're watching Georgian Showbiz News. We've got all the latest news on all the latest stars. Coming up later, we've got Samuel Bissett. Awesome! Yes, the Georgian entertainer who taught his dog to dance with a monkey is back with his new act, a tortoise who can fetch like a dog. Cute. Fetch! Fetch! Get the ball! And we've got an exclusive report on the death of circus exhibit Daniel Lambert. Sad face. The 52 stone man mountain passed away last week and there were tears at his funeral. Oh no, I'm not a relative. I didn't even know the man. I just put me back out carrying his coffin. But first, you won't believe it. I gotta meet Daniel Wildman. That's right, the Daniel Wildman, London beekeeper and showman extraordinaire. Check me out. Daniel's act involves riding a horse whilst wearing a mask of bees. And he's certainly got the whole of Georgian Britain buzzing. Daniel, hi. I was going to give you a showbiz kiss, but I think I better keep my distance. <laughs> Don't worry, my bees won't sting you. I've got them well trained. What's this? Awesome. How do you do it? I've tied a thread around the queen bee, pull her around, and the others just follow. Simple. Are you sure they won't sting? They sound kind of angry. Relax. If they do get out of control... You're going to shoot them? No, no, no. One shot from this, and I can send them all back to their hive. Ta-da! Great. Now, Daniel, you've got a new book out? The Complete Guide for the Management of Bees Throughout the Year? What's it about? Ow! I thought you said your bees wouldn't sting me. It's not one of my bees. <clears throat> this is Penny Bell with Bee Man Daniel Wildman, and I've just been stung. Oh, and that's five shillings for the book. Twice. What's up, landlubbers? Now the pirate channel's going underground, well below deck anyway, as we meet the baddest pirate of them all. It's time for HHTV Cribs. Yo, 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 HHTV! My name's Blackbeard, and this here is my crib, the Queen Anne's Revenge, and I loves her. Mmm, bear salty. Made in Britain, but on the inside, it's got kind of a classic French vibe. That's because the French stole it off the British, and then we stole it off the French! <laughs> so, when we nicked her, she was a French merchant ship, but we needed a pirate ship. So we pimped her up, changed the logo. The old one was whack. We kept the chef, though. Those dudes can cook it up. Check out the music system I got in the aft. Oh, yeah. Proper banging, that. Yo, this is the booty room. This is where I keep my gold. Bling in. Sugar, sweet, and my medicine, sick. Or rather, not so sick. Gotta show you the toilet I put in for the crew. State of the art. It's basically a rope cage over the ocean. They love a poo with a view. <laughs> you right, Francois? Bonjour, mon capitaine. Lunch smells good, what are you cooking? Meat filled with my guts, followed by biscuits covered in weevils. The food always kind of rots once we've been at sea for a few weeks. Oh, <laughs> Put some cannons in. Got 40 of these bad boys. Out. Over here we got some homies chilling out. What's that? Help, my name's Percival Sprite. I've been kidnapped by Black Beard. Oh, I love this guy. He cracks me up. Here he is. Here's the man himself. Israel Hands. Say hello, Israel. All right. Oh! <laughs> That was just for fun. When you go into the battle, you've got to get your swagger jagger on, right? This is my room. This is where I keep all my nice rich clothes. I stole them off people I killed up. Actually, that's quite a nice scarf you've got there. What? Can I have a quick look at that? Hey, where are you going? Uh, I'm out of here. Blackbeard was a truly evil man, and he met an appropriately horrid end. In 1718, he was killed in a battle at sea, his head was chopped off and his headless body thrown into the sea. Blackbeard, R.I.P. Or rather, R.I.P. 
Hello and welcome to the news at when. When? 1789, when the people of France decided that King Louis XVI and his rich friends had been living the high life at their expense for long enough and that it was time for common people to run the country. Here with more details is Bob Hale with the French Revolution Report. Bob. Thank you, Sam. Well, sacre bleu me, if that isn't France, which it is, if it's not the 1780s, which it is, and if that right there isn't a very angry Frenchman, which it is, and he's got every right to be, because back then France was very much a country of le haves and le have nots, where the posh people had fine food, fancy clothes, palaces and helicopters, while the poor people, like this chap, don't even have the bread on their table. But how can they... What? I don't think I did say helicopters, <laughs> but how do these poshos afford all that stuff, I hear you ask? Well, by taking money from poor taxpayers, like our friend here, and then borrowing even more money from other countries, which means that by 1789, France is riddled with debt, and most French people are penniless and hungrier than an alligator on the moon. All while King Louis XVI and his posh chums are living it up big styling. Terrible, really, but I guess that's just the way things are, and there's not a lot you can do about it, right? Wrong! The commoners strike up a plan to remove the king and run the country themselves, which signals the start of the one and only, the world's famous, ladies and gentlemen, it's the French Revolution! Viva la Revolution! Sorry, I, I get a bit carried away. <laughs> and the revolutionaries don't hang around. They storm the Bastille, a famous old fortress here in Paris, partly to show the king his boss and partly to steal a load of explosives. Oh! Well, that's angry mobs for you. <laughs> so King Louis, fearing for his life, dresses up as a Russian aristocrat's butler, a little bit weird, and runs off to hide up here in a place called something or other. A cunning plan that works this much. Yep, not at all. The king is captured, he's brought back to Paris and told that he's not in charge anymore. He keeps the crown, but he loses most of his power, influence and helicopters. And that's what? I didn't say helicopters. And things go from bad to worse for King Louis. In 1792, France declares war on Austria, a neighbouring country who want the revolutionaries out and the king back in. So they tell the revolutionaries that if they don't put the king back in, they'll start doing some pretty horrible things to the French people. A very clever tactic that works this much. Yep, not at all. Turns out the revolutionaries just hate being told what to do. They completely ignore the threat, accuse the king of plotting with the Austrians and cut his head off. Then they cut his wife's head off. And then, frankly, they just get a little bit carried away. Soon they are cutting heads off left, right and centre, declaring anyone who doesn't agree with everything they say as an enemy of the revolution, a crime punishable by, yes, you've guessed it, having your head cut off. In fact, if we look at the head cutting off ometer, we can see that somewhere between 16 and 40,000 heads were cut off in just two years. So many, in fact, that they not only broke our thingy, but they had to invent a whole new head cutting off thingy called the guillotine. So, at that time, it was all cut his head off, cut her head off, Cut his head off, cut her head off, until finally, after five long years and lots and lots of heads being cut off, the people of France said, stop cutting people's heads off! And they took the man responsible for most of the heads being cut off, Maximilian Robespierre, and yep, you've guessed it, they cut his head off. And that's the end of the French Revolution, the end of the French royalty, and if I don't get a cup of tea and a biscuit in the next three seconds, it might very well be the end of old Bobsy. Oh, thank you so much, thank you, thank you. Oh, oh, that feels so much better. You you know, now, now I think of it, I did say helicopter there, didn't I? I think I just need a holiday. Sam, a couple of weeks in the Maldives? Welcome to the news at when. When? 1789. And the peasants in France have grown tired of being poor and hungry while King Louis XVI and his rich friends live in luxury. The French Revolution is about to begin. Let's go over live to Mike Peabody, who is outside the Bastille Fortress in Paris. Mike. Thanks, Sam. You join me right outside the Bastille, France's most infamous prison, where a large mob of very angry Frenchmen has gathered. We are very angry. Yeah, I, I just said that. Two negotiators are being sent inside to arrange the release of the king's prisoners. And we are going to put the governor on trial for treachery. They're going to put the governor on trial for treachery. I know, I just said that. All right. Let's see if we can follow them inside. They're in, let's go. Vive la revolution. What he said, are you the governor of this prison? Uh, no. That right there is the Marquis Bernard Delaunay, the governor of this prison. Thanks, mate. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I thank you. Know. Thanks very much. Yes, I am the governor of the prison. We are here on behalf of all our revolutionary brothers who starve in the streets while you aristocrats live in luxury. We demand the release of all prisoners and... Uh, are those, um, pan au chocolat? Oui. Would you like one? 
Oh, I wouldn't mind. I mean, say, look, yeah, he's very nice. He's he might have a little Unbelievable! Bit. We demand our release of all of our revolutionary brothers and sisters who starve in this... Is that a crayfish? Uh, it's lobster stuffed with caviar. Please. Oh. So there we have it, in an extraordinary turn of events, the negotiators, far from putting the governor on trial, have instead decided to sit down for a meal with him, a little bit far away from their own revolutionary principles, I would suggest. There you are! You took so long, we thought you'd been captured! So we stormed the Bastille. No, I am fine, fine like these fine, fine cheeses. Oh. Have you tried the governor? No, but we have tried the veal. Oh. Mm. Mm. Honestly, if you want a job done properly, you have to do it yourself. Vive la Révolution! So, there we have it. Thanks in part to a long lunch, the Bastille has been stormed. The common people of France have risen up to declare war on the rich. Louis XVI, if you are watching, I'd watch your neck if I were you. And that is how we deal with the upper classes. Well, that's a jolly good show. Jolly good show? Yep. You're not upper class, are you? Mm. No, 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 I'm not upper class at all, no, 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 I just, um, no, I, uh, sort of middle class really, but sort of minor public school. This is Mike Peabody reporting live from the Bastille for HHTV News, really wishing he was somewhere else. Oh. You're watching HHTV Sport, bringing you exclusive live sporting events from the past. Today is football. And time to go over to the 1950s to join our reporter who's about to meet a very special player. I've come to 1951, where I'm here to interview the greatest English football striker of all time. It... Sorry, do you mind moving along, please, love? You just clear off. I'm here to interview the all-time greatest English football striker. Well, you're looking at her. <laughs> what, really? Yeah. My name's Lily Parr. I scored over 900 goals in my career. I scored 43 goals in my first season, and we were only 14 at the time. Wow, that's impressive. In 1920, 53,000 people turned up at a ladies' match at Goodison Park, and I was star attraction. Well, should we, uh, should we, should we carry on the interview then? Let's do this. Okay. <clears throat> so, Lily, tell us, how did your career start? Well, when all the men went off to fight in First World War, women's football came right popular. I worked at a munitions factory and I played for the ladies' football team. We used to draw huge crowds. I see, but... Uh... When the war ended and the men came back, I imagine everyone went back to watching men's football. No, no, you see, the ladies' game was still really popular. So popular, in fact, that in 1921, the Football Association got nervous that we were threatening the male game, so they banned women from playing at official league grounds. Oh, that is a shame, isn't it? But let's be honest, men are better at football than women, aren't they? Listen, mate. I've played against men at exhibition matches, and I'm telling you now, I've got a harder shot than any of them. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, I do think so. Well, I don't. This is Tony Codger reporting for HHTV News. Oh, oh, she's not wrong. She's got a kick like a flipping mule. Oh. 